Should we baptize infants? This is perhaps one of the most common questions that is asked in association with any discussion of baptism. People want to know, should we be pedo-baptists or credo-baptists? Should we recognize infants as having faith or not? Should they be included fully in the life of the church or not? I think it can be helpful to step back a bit from this question and to think about some of the things that are involved in it. One of the things that is involved is the question of how infants relate to faith. When thinking about infants having faith, often we struggle to understand the relationship between infants and faith because we think in terms of individuals alone. We think about faith as a purely internal state. Faith as something that is distinct from external commitment or loyalty. Faith that is a very individual state that is distinct from a more corporate or shared state. Faith is something that is very subjective rather than something that might have a more objective form to it. But yet in scripture, faith has a broader reality to it. Faith is something that can characterize not just individuals, but groups. Faith is something that can be a reality for a family. There can be such a thing as a faithful family. And that's more than saying that just each and every member of the family is faithful. The family itself can have a character to its life that is characterized by faith. Within the story of scripture, it can also be important to recognize the ways in which infants throughout and children are implicated in the faith of their parents. This can be seen in stories of healing. Within the stories of the Gospels, Jesus heals on several occasions people on account of the faith of some other party. Whether that's the faith of a father or a mother, whether it's the faith of a master. There are a number of cases, for instance, where the paralyzed man who is healed on account of the faith of his friends, and not just healed, but his sins are declared to be forgiven. In scripture, the examples can be multiplied. We might think about the children being blessed on account of their parents bringing them to Christ to receive his blessing. Throughout scripture, then, there are ways in which children are implicated in the faith of their parents. And why shouldn't they be? In scripture, as in our daily lives, we are not isolated individuals. We are individuals who are bound up with others. When I was born, I did not choose all my loyalties. I did not choose my identity. My identity was something that I received. I was given a name I did not choose. I, was, I found myself with a nationality that I never selected for myself. These are things that I was born with. I was also born into a Christian family, a family in which I was raised in the love and admonition of the Lord. I was taught to relate to him as father. And for that reason, I was not a neutral individual, not an individual who stood by myself in detachment from anyone else. I would have one day to enter into a fuller appreciation and claim and grasp of these things for myself. But as an infant and as a young child, I shared in the faith of my parents. That is a real faith. It's not a faith that is just pretended on the part of the infant. They are truly participating in it. And as we grow up, we realize in many ways we do not work as detached individuals. We are connected with other people. And why should that not be the case? If the Lord is going to restore humanity, is he just going to restore adults? Is he going to restore all stages of human beings, all stages of life from the infant to the grave, men and women and children of all different ages. All of us are going to find ourselves represented in the new heavens and the new earth. And this expectation is one that we have many anticipations of in salvation, forms of salvation in the Old Testament. For instance, the saving of not just Noah and his wife, but also his three sons and their wives. The family of Noah is implicated in his salvation. You can think about the way that not just Abraham, but Abraham and his whole sheikdom or family are brought into the promised land to, made, to be made participants of the blessings there. You might think also of the way that Moses leads a great company out, among which there are many children. They participate in the salvation with the adults. 
And so the very shape of salvation as we see it revealed in the Old Testament and in the New is one that seems to include children, and almost by expectation. We read, for instance, about the baptism of households. Now, the expectation is that if the leader of the household, if the head of the household is baptized, all other members will be baptized unless they are specifically objecting. This is a promise of the inclusion of all parties within the life of the family, within the new life of the kingdom of God. We are being brought into participation in this renewed reality and that every single family, every single community is invited to make this transition, to participate in this new reality in Christ. Baptism, as we've thought, is related to our bodies. And our bodies are, as it were, the very root of ourselves. Before we have any subjectivity, that we might have a subjective faith, before we have any sort of agency, that we might make some sort of action, before we have any sort of volition by which we might make a decision, we are bodies. And baptism is performed upon our bodies. It's an action that we don't baptize ourselves, we are baptized. Now, when we think about those persons who are most fully identified with their bodies, infants are the example that should come to mind. Infants are identified and embedded in their bodies. They receive their identity from outside. Our bodies are the objectivity of the self. It's the self as an object within the world that other people can relate to. And before we ever have any sense of subjectivity, we have the objectivity of our bodies. And in the same way as our bodies are named, identified, brought into a belonging in a family, not just left out on the streets or exposed in the wilds to identify themselves, we are given an identity, we're given a belonging. And in the same way with baptism, baptism is something that, in which all of us, in some sense, are newborn infants. We are enrolled into a new family. We are declared to have a new name. We are identified by the name of Christ. He is the one who gives us our identity now. No longer the old identities and the old solidarities that we once were part of. And so when we baptize infants, we are declaring something not just about them, but about baptism that is true for all of us. The baptism is the beginning of a new life. Baptism is not performed on the basis of anything that we bring to the baptism. Any sort of decision that we have made for Christ of our own power, any sort of agency that we can exercise for Christ, any sort of subjective faith that is worthy of baptism. These are not the things that mark us out for baptism. Primarily, it is God's grace. And God's grace, as we are marked out for baptism, is something that we can receive through the faith of others, through the faith of our parents, through the faith of those who raise us as guardians, perhaps. And as we are brought into the fellowship of Christ, we are encouraged to enter into possession of agency, enter into possession of a subjectivity, and enter into possession of a true volition that is in line with the identity that we are being given in Christ. This is a rediscovery of ourselves. It is becoming new babes in Christ. And in the same way as children are raised in the life of the family, so we are going to be raised in the life of a new family. We are raised as those who are identified as children of God. As we look through the Old Testament, we can also see ways in which children are included within the life of the people of faith. If we think about, for instance, the crossing of the Red Sea, Pharaoh would very much have liked for the Israelites to leave their children behind in Egypt. The expectation would be that they would go off and worship God at the mountain and then return for their children. But that's not what the Lord allowed to happen. They had to go with their children. And it was with their children that they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The children were implicated in that event just as the adults were. You might also think about circumcision, the example most commonly given in connection with infant baptism. In circumcision, the infant who was a part of Abraham's household was marked out on the eighth day with the adults. They were marked out with the sign of faith. 
the sign of the righteousness of faith, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 4. That sign of the righteousness, righteousness of faith is not just the righteousness of individual faith. It's the sign of the faith of Abraham their father, the sign of the faith of one who went before them, exercising faith in some sense in their stead, but also as one in whose footsteps they should walk. As we grow up, we're supposed to grow into the image of our father and the descendants of Abraham, as they were circumcised and shared that sign of the righteousness of faith, were supposed to mark themselves out by that faith that they had been marked out by. They have that mark of Abraham's faith upon them, and now they need to live by Abraham's faith. That's the same way with our baptism. We are marked out by the faith of Jesus Christ, by his baptism in the Jordan, by his baptism in his death and by his baptism of the church at Pentecost, that we might now live in the newness of that life, the life that we have been distinguished by, whether adult or infant. This is what it means to be a Christian, to live out the meaning of our baptism throughout the entirety of our lives. Whether we remember our baptism or not, its meaning holds certain for here and now and for many years in the future until the fullness of its promise has been realized in the new heavens and the new earth. <laughs>